Australia is an immigration nation, but a hundred years ago, this wasn't the plan. The Commonwealth of Australia was built on a paradox. The paradox was they were going to realise a utopia, but they were going to do it through excluding the vast majority of humanity. From 1901, this meant tough restrictions on immigration. The White Australia policy. We would be an exclusively white community. There would be no one in Australia other than members of the white race. This was the objective. The plan started to work. But after World War II, Australia adopted a bold and radical new strategy. The government is embarking upon a high-risk picture. It's a major U-turn in immigration policy. For the first time, assisting large numbers of Europeans to come to Australia. Homeless people are on the move. White was redefined. Migrants recruited en masse from war-ravaged Europe. They checked you uh, physically, like the old horse traders looked in your teeth and uh, stark naked so that they could, you know, see that you have got movements in all your arms and legs. But some still had no place, even in this new Australia. After the war, government started to bring people from Europe, your wartime enemies. On the other hand, they wanted to deport Asians. That is because of colour. In a single decade, the country opened its doors to a million migrants, but somehow clung more strongly than ever to its cherished white Australia policy. This is the secret history of us. How modern multicultural Australia was forged against the odds. nation we live in today is a story made possible by one of the darkest moments in Australia's history. A huge Pacific area is Japanese territory by right of conquest. War laps the shores of Australia. Bombs rain on Darwin. A devastating raid shatters the town. The Japanese attack on Darwin in February 1942 exposed the vulnerability of a nation. Australia had not been able to defend itself. Um, and they foresaw a third world war, major conflicts ahead. Underlying this is the concern that Australia is seriously underpopulated. The number one problem facing Australia at the end of World War II is there are simply not enough Australians. There are not enough Australians to defend the nation. Immigration was the only solution. There are just seven million Australians. The Labor Prime Minister, Ben Chifley, believes this number must be trebled. As leader, he immediately creates an entirely new ministry, the Department of Immigration. His close friend, Arthur Caldwell, becomes its first minister. The Chifley government was very decentralised. Uh, ben Chifley, the, the Australian Prime Minister, always insisted that his ministers be allowed to get on with it, that his ministers were the contact point on these big issues, whether it be Dr Evatt, the Foreign Affairs Minister, or Arthur Corwell as Minister for Immigration. So it was very clear um, to Corwell that, that he took the running. Of course, that meant great risk, but it also meant great opportunity. Corwell is quick to take full advantage of his free reign. On the bitterly cold winter's day of August the 2nd, 1945, he rises to make his maiden ministerial statement. He exploits the nation's deeply held fear of Asian invasion to overcome another fear, mass immigration. 
His first speech as Minister for Immigration is a famous speech that we now call the Populator Parish speech, where he essentially said, we have 20 years to prepare uh, for the next war against Japan. Well, the Japanese were almost on our shores in 1942, and Curtin and the rest of us thought that uh, we had to do something about building up our population, and so um, I coined the phrase, we either fill this country or we lose it. His strategy is to begin with that fear campaign, to scare Australians into realising we need more people. We can't make enough Australians internally. We need to look to migration. The country doesn't just need a massive increase in population to defend itself. The nation urgently needs building. Without the largest immigration program in its history, Australia could wither and die. Australia had made a transition during the war to a, a full-scale industrialised economy. And as, as peace began, there was the opportunity of continuing that transition. And so it's an engine that had got going in World War II, but it's running out of petrol. You know, the petrol is people. There's not enough people. The need is real, but Caldwell and the government know the Australian public is deeply sceptical about immigration. Australia is 99% white and almost entirely British. In a time of great uncertainty, most want to keep it that way. There's a lot of concern amongst policymakers about how Australians will react to large-scale immigration. Australia is having to demobilise thousands of service people. There are severe housing shortages. It's a time of great social upheaval. So to announce the arrival of thousands more people at this time is a very, very sensitive political issue. But before overcoming these concerns, before the great immigration scheme can even get underway, the fallout and the horrors of the war intervene. Willy Lerma was a carefree teenager in Poland when the German army threw him in a truck and took him away. By 1945, he finds himself in Dachau concentration camp, barely alive and weighing just 38 kilograms. The only thing which was in my mind was food, food, food and survival, that's all. I even forgot that I had a family, that I had parents and a sister. I, I, I never thought about them because my tummy didn't let me do it. If they would shoot me or send me to the gas chamber or hang me, there was nothing I could do about it, no hope. Already starving to death, the day comes when Willie is led to the shower block. I burst out crying with bitter tears. I thought, that's the end of me now. That hose there, I don't know what they're going to do with me. But then through the hose started to come the warm water. A wonderful feeling. Till today, I can't find a proper word, an English word to say how wonderful that feeling was on my body. You know, I said, yeah, that I must be liberated. The scale of the horror is slowly revealed. Colwell responds, issuing 2,000 landing permits for Holocaust survivors. But even this humanitarian response is greeted with ridicule by the press. In 1946, when Jewish immigrants began to arrive, uh, he was depicted very negatively, as somehow favouring uh, a group of people who were hard to believe in the aftermath of the Holocaust, but who were depicted in some cartoons as rats and as Corwell as a Pied Piper. And it served to warn Corwell how difficult it was to inaugurate major changes in immigration policy. Unlike Holocaust survivors, the British are welcomed with open arms. 
they continue to arrive in their thousands. The boys are met by the Minister of Immigration and Information. We trust that you will settle down in Australia, marrying Australian girls or girls from the old country. We want hundreds of thousands of men like you, and we want many, many thousands of young women too. Since Federation, Australia has relied upon the motherland to keep the nation white. But there's a major problem now. From as early as 1942, one of Caldwell's advisers in Canberra, W.D. Forsyth, warned that Britain could no longer be relied upon to provide all the migrants Australia needs. Despite this, in November 1946, Caldwell makes the extraordinary announcement that he hopes for every one foreign arrival, there will be 10 British migrants. There's one problem with this message that Corwell is pumping out. It's completely untrue, and he knows that it's untrue. There's, he's seen the reports. He knows there's no way in the world there's going to be enough British migrants coming out to sustain the majority of Australia's post-war development needs. Colwell's economy with the truth seems designed to diffuse public concerns over non-British immigration. As the first post-war migrant ship arrives, his strategy seems entirely justified. On the foggy Melbourne morning of the 20th of April 1947, Colwell walks onto Victoria docks and into a media storm. Victoria docks Melbourne. The Misa, first of the post-war immigration vessels to arrive in this country, is awaited by thick crowds giving welcome to friends and relatives. All types from a dozen European countries clutter the ship's side for the first glimpse of the country which is to be their home. The Misa is packed with more than 600 people from 26 countries. Colwell has tried to give priority to British migrants. But it is the dark-skinned passengers from war-torn Europe and the Middle East that become the focus. The awaiting media see their arrival as an attack on the integrity of a white Australia. With thousands of higher living nationals awaiting entrance, English, Nordic types and Americans, who can offer this country ideas and culture, it is little wonder that this project has been the centre of a bitter controversy. The Mesa story is beamed into cinemas throughout Australia. In a time before television, newsreels are seen by huge audiences. This was shown in every cinema on a Saturday night and throughout the week. And the newsreel is shaping public opinion by only showing these images of these foreign-looking aliens. Minister of Information and Immigration, Mr. Corbo, has been the target for strong press criticism in this immigration venture. This tone is very unusual for a newsreel of that time, to actually make such an editorial statement, so directly attacking the minister and so directly stating at this time that they don't want people of this type, they want their own Nordic stock. Let us hope that immigration of the future will be planned deliberately and intelligently and offer more opportunities to the people of our own stock. Corwell's got a crisis. He's really at the mercy of the newsreels now. It cannot be clearer. Non-British immigration will be met with vicious criticism. And yet there are not enough British migrants to meet Australia's needs. The solution to this dilemma will change Australia forever. Since becoming the nation's first immigration minister in 1945, Arthur Corwell has been vilified in the press and in the newsreels. There are deep fears his post-war populate or perish plan threatens the very integrity of white British Australia. But after two years on the back foot, the man who learned his trade as Minister for Information launches a propaganda campaign, appointing himself as Chief Salesman. Call had learnt a lot from his time as Minister for Information about the way in which the Commonwealth, the government, could publicise its activities and its efforts. And so, looking at the way in which the government had played a role in wartime propaganda, Corwell immediately sees how that can be applied to arguing and supporting the case for immigration. 
Given that Arthur Corwell and the Australian media hated each other's guts, the fact that Arthur Corwell had to become a media star in order to get his new migration scheme off the ground can only be considered as a very deep historical irony. Corwell's mission to recruit new migrants is about to take him to the other side of the world. But before he sets off, he takes his message of fear directly to the Australian people. The mission on which I am now embarking is vital to the nation. I am going abroad to seek ships or immigrants. If we have no ships, we shall get no immigrants. And without immigration, the future of the Australia we know will be both uneasy and brief. As a nation, we shall not survive. When Corwell sets off for Europe in 1947, he does not have a clear uh, understanding of what will be the outcome of his mission. He had opportunities, he had meetings. He is, in effect, putting his toe in the water, testing the waters. Caldwell has told the public that his trip to England and Europe is to secure shipping for migrants. But he has another idea. Well, he says he's going off to view the situation in Great Britain and see what he can do about shipping shortages. But there's no doubt that he's, he's also going to go to Europe and uh, have a look at uh, the displaced persons camps and the quality of the people there, from, about which he's been getting very positive reports since 1945. There's almost a million displaced people in war-torn Europe. They could easily provide the answer to Australia's population problem. 18-year-old Lithuanian Andrew Yankus has spent his teenage years fleeing the Russians and then the Nazis. Now in a refugee camp in Germany, going home is not an option. I didn't want to go back because I know I would end up going to Siberia like a lot of other people even after the war that got sent because Stalin just was, he was a madman. So then the International Refugee Organization took the camps over and we were offered to emigrate. Just hours after checking into the Hyde Park Hotel in London on the 27th of June, 1947, Caldwell meets with the International Refugee Organization. Their task is to resettle displaced people like Andrew Yankus. But Caldwell soon discovers a problem. Other countries are in the market. There is an international competition for the best quality displaced persons. So by 1947, there's really an understanding that if they don't act now, it may be too late. Suddenly, it's a race against time. Those many consider a threat to white British Australia are now highly prized immigrants. Colwell cables Prime Minister Chifley from London. He urges immediate action and permission to sign the agreement with the International Refugee Organization. Chifley's response is remarkable. Doing away with all convention, he keeps the decision a secret from his own party and gives Colwell the green light. Chifley cables back an OK. He doesn't go to Cabinet, he doesn't check it with Labour caucus. If he did, it's quite possible, almost entirely likely, that Cabinet would have said no. Not interested in taking refugees from Europe after 50 years have been spent you know, trying, doing their best to keep out of Australia you know, these same people. Well, we can only speculate on, on why it did not go to Cabinet. But the, the degree of trepidation on embarking on a program of large-scale immigration from Europe um, you can't underestimate how strong that was in 1947. And we can only make sense of that in terms of how insular Australia had become and how much of a challenge that this posed potentially to Australian identity and Australian nationalism. Such is the concern over anything that may upset the status quo of a white British Australia, the two leading lights in the government have gone it alone and staked Australia's future on a bold new plan. It's the Prime Minister and the Minister for Immigration. 
and it's an agreement between those two men that engineers this completely new direction in Australian history. A small team of immigration officers is immediately dispatched to the displaced persons camps in Germany. George Kittle is one of them. He's appalled by what he finds. You can imagine what it would be like not being able to get a decent wash of soap, not being able to get anything that you uh, like butter that would be non-existent in these camps. DP stew or soup you felt that it was just a bowl of hot water with a turnip drag through it, you know. The United Nations Refugee Agreement on the selection process is clear. Australia cannot discriminate on the basis of race or religion. But after the backlash he received following the arrival of the Mesa, Colwell has other ideas. He plans to fill a ship with the right type. They won't be British, but they will be white. They will be healthy and they will be beautiful. And they will sell the idea of European immigration to a sceptical Australia. George Kiddle gets to work. We could only select people that came from the Baltic states, but we had to do it very, very quickly. That was one of the troubles. And we had to tell them bluntly what they were expected to do. The selection teams are instructed very clearly to select people from Latvia and the Baltic countries and to have blonde, buxom women. They were known as balls. And in fact, they made such a good impression that they were called the beautiful balls. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed Andrew Yankus is precisely what George Kiddle is looking for. And after years of fleeing persecution, Yankus sees a new life far from war-ravaged Europe. We got a notice in the camp on the notice board to say those that are interested to going to Australia, put, put their name down and you, know, you will be interviewed. So some friends of mine and myself, we said, oh yes, well, it's the furthest away from the whole lot of Europe. But good looks alone won't guarantee a place for Andrew and his fellow Bolts on the first ship. Irrespective of their skills and talents, George Kittle needs to select fit, able-bodied men to help build the nation. Their entry and right to stay in Australia is only granted if they sign work contracts. We'd be looking for decent-looking people, if you like. Looked as if they'd be able to do the work that we expected them to do in Australia. Put it on. And amongst us, they were doctors and engineers, architects, but everybody had to put down labourer on your application. Otherwise, you, you didn't have a chance of getting in. <laughs> and some of them were pretty highly qualified in their own countries who were telling them that those, rec those qualifications would not be recognised. Well, actually, I think they're just looking for slaves. So we might sometimes have a look at their hands to see if they, they looked as if they could do some hard work. <laughs> they checked you uh, physically, virtually, you know, like the old horse traders looked in your teeth and uh, stark naked so that they could, you know, see that you have got movements and all your arms and legs and, you know, it was worse than a bloody military. <laughs> Yankus is one of 844 former refugees selected for the crucial first boat. But as Colwell returns to Australia, he keeps their imminent arrival and any mention of displaced persons to himself. There's been a tremendous amount of interest in your mission, Mr. Colwell. Would you say that it's been a success? And, uh, yes, it was a success, all right. Good. We've got so many people uh, around the world now wanting to come to Australia that uh, if they all came here, well, we just wouldn't know how to house them and uh, we'd uh, complicate our economy. Following Colwell home is the General Stuart Heinzelman, the first shipload of beautiful bolts. They are the Trojan horse 
who will sell the most ambitious immigration scheme in Australia's history. Blissfully unaware of the role they're about to play, those like Andrew Yankers are coming to terms with leaving their lives as refugees behind. They said that come to Australia, the roads are not paved with gold, but you will make a living, a good living, and, and you'll, you'll live happily. On the 7th of December, 1947, the beautiful Bolts arrive at Prince's Pier, Melbourne. Caldwell's new propaganda machine is ready and waiting. Everybody gathered on the ship's deck and uh, there was welcoming speeches made. Photographers and movie cameras were going flat out. Very highly choreographed. There's a lot riding on those first couple of arrivals. They have to make an impression on the Australian people. You can see Corwell was a brilliant propagandist. He knew that this was going to go down with the public. Cine Sound, the newsreel people were on side as well because you can see the way it's cut, the wide shots of people standing on deck and the images that were selected for the newsreel, they are blonde, they are young, they are sexy. They're actually wearing dark glasses. They're looking very affluent, even though they came from refugee camps, these people. The message is clear. The new arrivals may not be British, but they're the next best thing. They'll fit in, and they will not threaten white Australia. We are really very, very happy to be here in Australia, and we hope to be very good Australian citizens. <laughs> Look, a lot of people got up. He likes us. <laughs> the beautiful Bolts have played their part in selling European immigration, but they have been used as window dressing. Tens of thousands more refugees will now follow, beautiful or not. Immigration officer Harold Grant is sent by Canberra to the displaced persons camps to help organize the huge expansion of the scheme. In March 1949, I went to Berlin where I met uh, Black Jack Galligan, General Galligan, the hero of Shangi. He said, your job is to go and select displaced persons. He said, there'll be good apples, and bad apples. But he said, there'll be more bloody good apples, Harold. And he said, we've got to fill the ships. And the ships have got to be filled as they come in. So go out there and do the job. What lies ahead of them? Some 170,000 displaced persons will eventually be ferried to Australia. They'll rival the number of British immigrants. The white in the white Australia policy is being redefined. The government is embarking upon a high-risk venture. It's a major U-turn in terms of immigration policy. What is being done is, for the first time, assisting large numbers of Europeans to come to Australia. Not British, not Irish, but European peoples in large numbers to come to Australia. To reassure the public, a documentary feature film is produced. It aims to show Australians what the displaced persons have endured and prove that the selection process is tough and rigorous. Does he speak English? Sprechen Sie auch English? A little. Harold Grant is working at the refugee camp in Liepheim when the government film crew arrives. He soon finds himself in front of the camera. I was selected to do the interview scene and uh, I was not told to accept or reject them. I was told my decision would hold and it would be one interview. Has he never had any police convictions? But what they're saying in that film is very important. This is not haphazard that people can just walk onto a ship. We are over there making sure that the right kind of people are on those ships for us. We left Europe in springtime. People from many countries. With thousands of DPs arriving, Colwell bullishly raises the bar on all immigration. 
The figure I set for 1949 was 110,000. The figure I have now set for 1949 is 150,000. The nation may be embarking on the largest immigration scheme in its history, but almost half a century since the white Australia policy was enshrined, there are still those who must be shown the door. In 1901, Australia's politicians passed laws to restrict and deport unwanted foreigners and keep the nation white. Almost 50 years later, Arthur Corwell may be leading the charge on a mass immigration scheme, but he is still bound by the racial thinking of his predecessors. What's more, he enjoys near universal support. He had no doubt that the Australian public was 100% behind the white Australia policy. And he also knew that all the parties represented in the parliament strongly supported that. He totally uncritically accepted and implemented those policies. This united white front is about to be tested by Asian refugees who came to Australia during the Second World War. Many provided invaluable manpower in the fight against Japan. Mostly Chinese, they proved eager and adequate in their work. Every launching marked their contribution in an all-out war to defeat the Japanese. The agreement was that in peacetime, the 6,000 refugees would return home. Most do, but around 500 have now settled and want to stay. They had children, they owned businesses. This outraged Cole because he believed they should not have done that, that Australia had been generous in granting them sanctuary. The danger was past, it was now time for them to leave. Arthur Garlock Chang, the youthful president of the Chinese Seamen's Union, is on the dock at Balmain in Sydney when a boatload of war refugees is deported. Some split forever from their new Australian families. Now, alongside me on the wall, there was an Australian lady with golden hair holding two babies to say goodbye to her husband on the ship sailing back. After the war, Cobo started to bring people from Europe from Germany, from Italy, your wartime enemies, you welcome them into Australia. On the other hand, you're trying to deport the Asians, the Malaysians, the Philippines, the Indonesians, the Chinese. That is because of colour. You've got to remember that Corwell is a man driven by process and principle. He was outraged that they had not left. He was outraged that they would marry Australians. He was outraged that they would buy their own businesses. 100 Chinese Formosan women, some with their husbands and 112 children, were compelled to board this hell ship already jammed past the danger point. Military police seized, and none too gently, all who refused to board the ship. Corwell believed with a passion that you either had a policy, such as the white Australia policy, and you enforced it without exception, or soon you would have no policy at all. Caldwell's uncompromising stance appears foolproof. But in the election year of 1949, a family living in Bond Beach, Victoria, are not willing to go quietly. The White Australia policy is about to go on trial. If we're trying to understand the end of the White Australia policy, the O'Keefe case of 1949 is a good starting point. When Japan invaded Indonesia in 1942, Annie Jacob was forced to flee with her family. As refugees, the Jacobs are offered sanctuary in Australia. Annie and her eight children soon make a new start for themselves. They were all doing very well at school. They all spoke with broad Australian accents. They were seen as important and good members of the community. In this respect, they, they are a quintessential immigrant success story. They've, they have, within the, the, the terms and conditions of the time, with this idea of embracing Australian values, become Australian. But in a country that wishes to be white, the family have outstayed their welcome. After five years, 
the government come knocking. Annie and her children, including 13-year-old Mary, are to be deported. My mother was really worried. She said, oh, we'll be... We've got the news that we might be going back to Indonesia. And, uh, um, of course, you know, uprooting us from all our schools and all that business. She was very, very worried. Annie's husband, Samuel, was killed in the war, fighting for the Allies. But before leaving to help defend Australia, he made a fateful decision to defend his family. Before he'd gone away to the war, he'd uh, made an arrangement with uh, his landlord, a retired postal clerk by the name of John O'Keefe, that if anything happened to him, he would look out for the family, uh, and he did. And so John O'Keefe begins to think about this, and he concludes that if he married uh, Mrs Jacob, she would then get British subject status, and therefore the family would be allowed to stay. It was very low-key, you know, very, very low-key. I mean, to an elderly gentleman with my mother getting married, you know. But the news got hold of it, so <laughs> it's pretty big. <laughs> Determined to enforce the deportation of all Asian wartime refugees, Arthur Caldwell becomes personally involved. He dismisses the marriage of John O'Keefe and Annie Jacob as a sham. On the waterfront at Bond Beach, Victoria, in this small house lives a family that is world news. What Colwell doesn't bargain for is that many Australians look beyond a policy and instead see a family who fit in and deserve to stay. The family got support from a number of quarters. Firstly, the press, which saw such an advantage here to hit and harm and injure Arthur Corwell, the Catholic Church. Uh, continued to play its role. Uh, Archbishop Mannix allowed himself to be photographed uh, with two of the girls, a, a clear endorsement uh, that he and the broader hierarchy of the Catholic Church supported the family. Even the local branch of the ALP, Corwell's State Victorian branch, agitated for the family to be allowed to stay. And there was a lot of people in the background helping, helping us out. They helped us in raising money. They helped us in getting my mother away from, you know, the limelight, you know, the journalists and all that, escape from the journal. The controversy goes all the way to the High Court of Australia in Melbourne. The court's decision on the 17th of March, 1949, writes the O'Keefe family name into the history books. I remember Uncle Jim and my mother going to court and coming out. And they say, oh, that's right. And I remember they say, oh, we won. That was the word, we won. We can stay. In a majority ruling, the court decided the O'Keeffe's should not be deported because of an administrative oversight when they were first admitted to Australia. Even though the decision is based on a technicality, Colwell believes the writing is on the wall for the white Australia policy. Colwell is absolutely outraged by the court's decision. He's convinced that, that this is the beginning of the end of the white Australia policy. The central pillars that have kept the, the policy in place for nearly 50 years have been undermined by the high court's decision. The O'Keefe case of 1949 does mark the beginning of the end of the White Australia policy. Not because of anything that, that Corwell sees, but because it reveals the truth of the lie. It shows that the policy is not about economics, that it's not about cultural homogeneity, it's about the colour of people's skin. As one family wins its fight to stay in Australia, tens of thousands of displaced persons are being shipped in but their arrival ignites fears that the Australian workforce will be threatened. How is Corwell to convince workers and union leaders and others that these newly arriving migrants aren't just going to take their jobs? Materials and men. Corwell addresses the fears head on and behind the scenes, 
lines up a deal. So there was an agreement in which the unions and major employers such as BHP were uh, parties, which provided that uh, the displaced persons would be taken on for the least attractive jobs. The deal is backed up in typical style with yet another exercise in spin. Some Australians may feel concern at this influx of new citizens. Sure, we've got to develop Australia, but it seems to me that these thousands of migrants coming here are going to do a lot of Australians out of jobs. Perhaps the Secretary of the Department of Immigration can throw some light on that. What is the answer, Mr Hayes? Well, today there are many more jobs in Australia than men to do them. As a matter of fact, our greatest shortage is manpower, both for defence and production. Furthermore, migrants will not make a shortage of jobs. They will make more jobs. In 1949 alone, 75,000 displaced persons arrive. They're bound by the work contracts they signed in the DP camps. Over the coming years, they'll work on nation-building projects across Australia, including the massive hydroelectric scheme in the Snowy Mountains. Meanwhile, beautiful Bolt Andrew Yankus finds himself reluctantly labouring at a cement kiln in Tasmania. I was taught to look after the kiln, the cement kiln, and Tasmania was that far backward in those days. We never was accepted by the local population. Oh, the call sorts of names for a start, Wogs. That was one of their favorites. We had quite a lot of fights, let's put it that way. The influx of new Australians shows no sign of letting up. But on the 10th of December, 1949, labor is dumped from power. Ben Chifley and Arthur Caldwell, the architects of the post-war immigration scheme, have been cast off by the electorate. Robert, Gordon Menzies, Robert Menzies, a believer in British Australia, is the new Liberal Prime Minister. The future of the new European immigration program could be in danger. Since the end of World War II, more than 200,000 migrants have arrived in Australia. They include the largest influx of European people in the nation's history. But a change in government in December 1949 seems to suggest the desire for non-British arrivals could be about to end. Corwell's out, Chifley's out. New government, the Liberal Party, run by Bob Menzies, a serious British Empire nut. And he comes in and there's a serious non-British migration scheme at work. You'd imagine big changes. But Bob Menzies does something that's almost as impressive as what Corwell did. Menzies comes in and he sees the migration taps are on, full bore, and he leaves them on. Throughout the 1950s, a thirsty economy will absorb the flood of new migrants. And now, for the first time, southern Europeans start to come in significant numbers. The colour line is shifting again. Eighteen-year-old Greek George Zangalis arrives into a country that at first doesn't quite live up to expectation. I left Greece and Europe in the middle of winter and arrived in Melbourne in the middle of summer. A scorcher, the temperature over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and a wind blowing, and Station Pier and Melbourne ports were, as you know, big sheds in those days, and all the pictures I had of Australia, a nice green place and flowers and, you know, the dream land, they were all destroyed within one day. At least George is fair-skinned enough to get here in the first place. To combat concerns that non-whites are slipping through the net, in 1950, the Department of Immigration introduces the so-called 75% rule. People had to provide genealogies which showed that they were substantially of European descent. 
let's say 75% of European descent, whatever that might mean. Those administering the new regulation have an all but impossible task. Just three years before, George Kiddle was on the lookout for beautiful bolts. Now he's working for a department asking itself, what is white? Well, I thought it was terrible, and so did anybody that had to, to interpret it. You were supposed to judge them, a mixed person, by appearance. 75% European by appearance. Can you imagine a more stupid policy than that? Aside from being a bureaucratic nightmare, the policy has more sinister connotations. There's a very close echo with the Nuremberg Laws. And the definition of who is a Jew, defined in terms of parentage, uh, how many grandparents do you have who are Jewish? This was, of course, a matter of life or death, whether you survived in the period of the Nazi rule in Europe. And yet we find the same policy or a similar policy being implemented in Australia. It's five years since Willy Lerma escaped the death camps of Dachau. Like most Holocaust survivors, he's only managed to get to Australia after being sponsored by distant relatives. Among his few possessions are some photographs he took after being liberated. One thing which I can't forgive the customs up today, I had a few pictures which I took from the camp of Dachau, and the pictures which I took, of course, they were after the war, and they took the pictures out. I said, why do you take it? And they said, oh, that could be propaganda. And that really, I didn't want to say nothing. You come to a new country, you don't want to start fight with the authorities. But having overcome the heavy-handedness of officials, Willie settles down with his young family, finds work, and discovers that ordinary Australians accept him for who he is. I think that uh, the Australian people those days weren't bad. With the people I worked, not that anybody asked me whether I was Jewish, and I didn't say. But I was just a new Australian. And I've been an Aussie since 1955. Fair dig Willie is doing precisely what Australia wants him to do, forgetting his past and fitting in. There has been no fundamental shift in the thinking of Australians. The thinking of Australians was that we were to be, as we were at present, an English-Australian country. So that the idea of allowing people to come from continental Europe did not indicate any significant shift in those fundamental premises. Rather, what had occurred was the idea that these people could be assimilated to become British Australians. The doctrine of assimilation also being applied to Aboriginal people is now used to ease the concerns of a country that's opening its doors to hundreds of thousands of European migrants, but still unable to let go of its white British identity. There was this tremendous expectation. You owe everything to this country, the country owes you nothing. And unless you become one like us, well, there's no place for you. So keep on trying until you get to become like us. I think we've got to understand it in the context of the times. In the 1940s and 1950s, policy makers, community leaders, thought of it as a very progressive doctrine and a very inclusive doctrine. It didn't assume that your cultural background decided your ability to adapt or conform or not. It assumed that you could be socialised into uh, embracing a new way of life. Learning English is a key cornerstone of the doctrine. Put the hat on. And the head of... <laughs> George Zangalis gets a job at the General Motors Holden factory in Port Melbourne. He quickly discovers that even his Greek boss is keen to stress the need to assimilate. He wouldn't speak Greek to us because it was not the thing to do. Now you're here, you've got to learn the language, not in two years' time, instantaneously. So he kept saying to me, will you, do this, will you do this, George, will you? 
And I says, look, Bill, my name is not William, it's George. You know, William, William. And uh, that was one little example. Workers for the city and workers for the land. Migrants like George may be under pressure to fit in, but the need for them to keep coming is great. Their hard labor doesn't just build a country and an economy. Ironically, it resolves a paradox that has existed since 1901. You begin the 20th century with Federation and this dream of a working man's paradise by keeping out the majority of the rest of the human race. 50 years later, that is finally becoming a kind of reality for the majority of people in Australia. But whereas in 1901, that dream of a working man's paradise was thought to be only realisable through restricting almost absolutely the amount of people you let in the country, it turns out that the way it's realised in the 1950s is through a massive scheme of migration and inclusion. February, 1954. And here they are at last, amongst us, moving in triumphal progress through each city in its turn. The very same year as the newly crowned Queen visits Australia, almost twice the number of European immigrants arrive than British. Soon, the one millionth post-war migrant will be welcomed. New Australians have ventured here from at least 30 countries. A progress royal indeed. The notion that Australia can somehow remain British and unchanged will increasingly be exposed as a myth. Ironically, the bold plan, continued by Menzies but started by Arthur Caldwell, has laid the foundations for the demise of white Australia. Arthur Caldwell, who was this vociferous champion of the white Australia policy, managed through his own implementation of you know, a new migration scheme to sow the seeds of the destruction of his cherished white Australia policy. The 25 metre boat carrying about 100... The genie may be out of the bottle, but it will take a humanitarian crisis to finally consign the white Australia policy to history. The battle to build modern multicultural Australia is set to enter a dramatic new era. Next on Immigration Nation, an Aboriginal activist and leader kidnaps a six-year-old and rocks the foundations of white Australia. About it firstly because it is a colour question. Nancy is being deported on the basis of one criterion alone and that's colour. And this is, this is bad and uh, immoral as far as I'm concerned. And for an interactive version, go to sbs.com.au forward slash immigration nation.